Well, welcome again to all of you. My name is Steve Meister. I'm a pastor who has the privilege of serving Emmanuel Baptist Church in Sacramento. We have been praying and working and looking forward to this day with great anticipation. We've been praying specifically that God would bless the efforts of uh, our speaker and our time together. And it's so wonderful to see so many familiar and new faces and with anticipation expecting all that the Lord will do today. I have the privilege of introducing our speaker today, Carl Truman. Carl is a professor of biblical and religious studies at Grove City College in Western Pennsylvania. He's also an ordained minister in the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. Um, I read a lot. There are very few authors I read uh, without concern as to what they've published on, and Carl would certainly be in that list. The rule of thumb I've had for a while now is if Carl Truman writes on it, I read it, and it has served me well. Uh, what has always struck me about uh, Dr. Truman's writings is it not only has the scholarly acumen and uh, research behind it uh, to identify issues and concerns in the church and culture, but he comes as a brother who has great pastoral concern, who has served as both a teaching and ruling elder in his denomination, and he has the courage by God's grace to say it forthrightly. And of course, we, many of us benefit from that, from his podcast co-hosted with Todd Pruitt. How many of you listen to the Mortification of Spin podcast regularly? Wonderful. That's always a helpful uh, 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 insight to so many things. His recent book, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self, which is uh, the uh, uh, spur of our conference in time today, may be his most important. And what I would suggest, and even to give you a framework as we look forward to hearing from Dr. Truman today, is it's ostensibly about the LGBTQ movement and the recent trends we've begun to notice in our culture in the last decade or two. But really, what Carl has done is written a book about all of us, about the culture we inhabit and some of the assumptions that we bring to life just innately because of the world we're growing up in. Uh, this book has really helped to help us navigate our culture and the assumptions that we may not question all the time, and certainly our neighbors and society don't. And I know personally since reading this, uh, the conversations I've had with neighbors, with uh, seatmates on airplanes who come from very different views of things, this book has really helped me have conversations where the blood pressure is lowered. And, I, and before we get into biblical sexual ethics, let's talk about the assumptions we're bringing to this conversation first. And so I think that that will be the fruit, I trust, of what we'll receive and benefit even from our time today. So with uh, no further ado, Dr. Truman, please come and instruct us. Thank you, brother. Well, it's a great pleasure to be with you all today and to uh, uh, spend some time talking about these issues. First of all, I want to give uh, thanks to the uh, various people, uh, Kyle and, uh, and Steve and company, who've made it possible for, for me and my wife to be here and have uh, uh, made it such a delightful time uh, so far. Uh, it is a pleasure to be in, in California. I, in fact, it's the second time in two weeks we've been back and forward, uh, and that's the, I think the third time we were in Sacramento Airport on, uh, on Thursday night. It's one of those, if it's Wednesday, it must be California kind of moments. Uh, <laughs> but it's a pleasure to be back. It's a bit more smoky than last time we were here just two weeks ago, uh, but it is a delight to be with you today. I want to talk uh, uh, about the, some of the most pressing topics that are uh, affecting uh, our world today, specifically those that I relate, uh, that I deal with in the, in the book, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. I cannot cover all the material that I deal with in that book in three relatively brief lectures, but what I want to do is, is try to, to drill down into why so many of the cultural transformations that are uh, catching us, it seems, uh, almost unawares, or which seem to be happening so fast, are taking place. Uh, I became, I won't say radicalized on this issue, but I, there were two incidents that, that started to, to focus my mind on issues pertaining to sexual identity. Uh, one of them was I gave a lecture at a, a Bible college in a strongly conservative area 
of the country. I won't name the Bible College, but this was probably in 2014 or 2015. The lecture I gave was on some aspect of the ancient church. I think it was on St. Augustine. But at the end of the lecture, I, I had 10 minutes to spare, and I just said to the kids who were there, okay, you can ask me any question. And I will uh, uh, do my best to answer any question. You know, it doesn't have to be on the ancient church, anything you want to ask me. And it was in the run-up to the uh, Obergefell v. Hodges decision of the Supreme Court, which was, of course, the Supreme Court decision that found gay marriage to be protected by the Constitution. And one of the young people in the room asked me, uh, what is your view of gay marriage? And I gave what I thought was a, 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 a moderately worded but firm response that I didn't consider gay marriage to be marriage, and these were the following reasons. And uh, this uh, person would not let go. And I drove away from the campus that day thinking, wow, if uh, a conservative student at a conservative Bible institution in the heart of what one might describe as the fundamentalist Bible belt uh, doesn't find the arguments that I made to be plausible, then we're in real trouble. Uh, the second thing that, that sort of radicalized me was uh, I was... Uh, at my kids went to the local public schools in the area we lived at, just outside Philadelphia. And in, I think it was 2016, I was approached by someone who, for various reasons, could not put their own name to a letter, uh, but asked me if I would be willing to draft with them a letter relative to the proposed transgender policies that were about to be proposed in the township. Uh, the township we lived in was to become the first township in Pennsylvania that adopted uh, integrational transgender policies for bathrooms, sports, etc., etc. And I agreed to, uh, to help draft this letter. You can find it online if you go to the, the website, firstthings.com. Uh, I agreed to draft this letter and sign it to front it because this other person, for various reasons that I can't go into, could not afford to have their name put on the letter. Uh, what shocked me were, about the letter was uh, one of the arguments I made in, in that letter was the school was stating in its policies that if a child came out as trans at school, uh, the school was under no obligation to tell the parents. It struck me as an interesting uh, principle that the school, by its own account, was essentially saying if a child comes out as trans, that is the child's identity, but the school has more right to know that identity than the parents do. It struck me that the school was essentially saying the school can know who the child is, but the parents have no right to do so. And that struck me as A, disgraceful, uh, and B, a massive overreach of school authority. So the very moderately worded letter that we put together about it focused on that issue. What was striking was that the parents didn't get it. The parents couldn't see what all the fuss was about. And that struck me as interesting, that if parents don't realize how their rights are being taken away from them and just don't care, by the time they do realize that, it will be far too late. So those were the, the two incidents that sort of galvanized me on these issues. By training, I'm a Reformation man, 16th, 17th century. I deal with obscure 16th, 17th century topics. But those two incidents made me think, well, People need to start speaking up on this. But of course, before we can speak up on these things, we first of all need to understand them. And what I want to do today is, is give a sort of summary of the, the, the argument of my book. And the argument of my book essentially is this, that uh, we go wrong if we think that the sexual revolution, and if we think that questions of sexual identity uh, can be explained in terms of sex. The argument of my book is that the changes we see in society around us happening with great rapidity and great speed at this point in time are actually symptomatic of much deeper and wider changes within how we think of ourselves within society. The title of my book is The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. And the self, I think, is the key to understanding what's going on and is the key to understanding how we might frame a compassionate, firm, and appropriate response. So that's where I want to go today. The first two lectures, I want to explore threads of the argument of my book. And in the final lecture, I want to raise questions of, well, what might it look like? Or how might conservative Christians 
respond on two levels to this. How might we respond, we would say, in the public sphere, as citizens who have a response, uh, responsibility for uh, the civic good, and how might we respond pastorally as Christians to those in our congregation, particularly young people who are very affected by what is going on within the wider society in which we belong. Now, I don't, I'm very uh, tech unsavvy, so we're now going to see if, if I can actually use this. Signs are not good. Um, signs are still not good. That's not good. It, the, it looks as if it's on to me. <laughs> no. no, that's not it. <laughs> I will take it from my computer, and as, if the slides catch up, they catch up. Okay, first thing I want to do is define three terms. The first slide is just three terms. The self, cultural amnesia, and sexual revolution. Those are three terms that I think we need to grasp in order to understand the arguments that I'm going to be making. First of those terms is the self. Now we're ahead of ourselves. Okay, that's it. The first of those terms is the self. Now there's a sense in which you know, you might say, well, well you know, the self, what is it? There, there, there's a common sense way we understand the self. You presumably have some level of self-consciousness. You're aware that you're not me. You're aware that you're not Donald Trump. You're aware that you're not Joe Biden. You're aware that you're not Gar Gavin Newsom. You have a level of self-consciousness that allows you to have a certain sense of individual existence. And that's sort of the common sense we, way in which we use it, where you might say, I myself disagree with that, meaning the self-consciousness that I am disagrees with that particular point. The way I'm using the self today, though, is in a, in a more sort of uh, technical and, and somewhat richer sense, and that is the self is the way we understand ourselves in relation to the world around us. How do we understand happiness? How do we understand fulfillment? How, we, how do we understand our identity? Not our identity simply as an individual self-consciousness, but in terms of our broader connection with the world around us. You understand yourself as a man or a woman or an American, a Cubs fan, a Phillies fan, whatever. There are all these senses of self. What do you, what do you think about the, the meaning of life? What do, you, what do you see the purpose of life? is that what does happiness mean to you? Where do you root your identity? What is it that makes you tick? How do you understand your relationship towards other people? How do you understand your responsibilities, your rights relative to other people? So when I'm using the term self, I'm using it in this much broader sense. We might say that, without wanting to be too pretentious, we might say sort of connects to what we understand the meaning of life to be and how we see ourselves fitting into it. How would we articulate our flourishing? How do we think about our authenticity? And my basic argument is this, that the answer to that question, what is the self, has changed dramatically over the last three or 400 years. And what we see today relative to uh, sexual identity, for example, the LGBTQ plus kind of issues, they are, in a sense, merely the latest symptomatic manifestation of deeper changes in what it means to be a human person that have taken place over the last 300 years. And it's important we grasp that, because one of the things that's most striking about what's going on in society at the moment is the sheer speed at which things to be ta uh, are taking place. And when things take place fast within society, that's usually a sign that they've been brewing for a long time. You don't suddenly get to a position 
where everybody believes something that everybody didn't believe the day before yesterday. Societies just don't change like that unless the dynamics of that change, unless the foundations of that change are long-standing and deeply laid. So that first uh, term I'm going to be using on a uh, point today is the self. And I want to make the case we should not, as, uh, as Christians, allow ourselves to be mesmerized by what I would describe as the superficial in terms of the, the surface or the immediate changes that we see around us. We should not allow ourselves to be mesmerized by the symptoms in such a way that we don't understand the causes. It's important to understand the causes, I think, for two reasons. One, it's rather depressing because it will make us realize the problem is actually much greater than we think, but it might also have the effect of making us panic less because it isn't as if everything's suddenly falling apart now. Things have been falling apart for a long, long time. So the first thing I want to, uh, th- uh, the, the first term to grab is, grab hold of is the self. Second one is cultural amnesia. Now, we're all aware of, of amnesia as a phenomenon. Uh, typically, you know, somebody is subject to some tremendous physical or psychological trauma, and uh, their memory, either in part or in the whole, is erased, often temporarily, sometimes permanently. Amnesia is something we tend to think of as it's something that happens to people. It's, it's something that hits them from the outside, over which they have no control. When I talk about cultural amnesia, I'm talking about something slightly different. I'm talking about a loss of memory. We're actually talking about an intentional loss of memory. I think we live in a time where our culture is deliberately moving to forget the past. Not so much in terms of, you know, not realizing that the past is there anymore, but in terms of denying that the past has any positive authority over the present. Uh, My discipline is history. Uh, I'm fortunate enough to teach at Grove City College, which is a somewhat distinctive college uh, in higher education these days. But typically, if you were pursuing a, a history degree at, uh, at, say, UCLA or somewhere like that, quite possibly in, in the class, what you would be taught would be a form of history that taught you to see history as nothing but oppression. Nothing but oppression, and therefore as something to be overcome, not something from which we can learn positively. Certainly, there's a lot of oppression in history. Problem comes when that's all you see in history. And that kind of approach to history, I would say, is part and parcel of a broad cultural phenomenon that I call cultural amnesia. This forgetting of the past. Think about uh, the the great biblical example, I think, of cultural amnesia is uh, the reign of King Ahab. In, uh, In 1 Kings, we hear Ahab arrives on the throne. He's worse than all the kings before him. No, because not only does he encourage the worship of the golden calves at Bethel and Dan, he reinstates Canaanite gods. He brings Baal back. Baal, who was sort of sent packing when the Israelites entered the promised land, is brought back. And then we're told, oh, and by the way, during Ahab's reign, heel of Bethel, rebuilt Jericho. Uh, and, you know, this man, heel of Bethel, rebuilds this town that was demolished when the Israelites invaded the Promised Land, and the Lord cursed the ground and said, never rebuild Jericho. Whoever rebuilds Jericho will do so at the price of two of his children. Heel of Bethel does that. Well, why does Heel of Bethel do that? In some ways, it's not because he's forgotten the past. It's because he wants to erase the past. I think Heel of Bethel knows exactly what he's doing. By rebuilding Jericho, he is erasing. He is erasing the evidence of God's deliverance of the, of, the, of the Israelite people at that particular point. It's cultural amnesia. And we live in a world, I think, that is by and large committed to forms of cultural amnesia for reasons that I shall talk about uh, uh, in this lecture or, or the next one. Third term, sexual revolution. And this is where I think a lot of uh, conservative uh, religious people and conservative Christians go wrong in that we tend to think correctly of the sexual revolution as something that really gained speed in the 1960s and has been sort of with us ever since, but incorrectly we, under, we misunderstand the radical nature of the sexual revolution. By and large, most people, I think if you ask them, would say, well, the sexual revolution involved the loosening of sexual morality. 
that behavior that was once considered uh, uh, to bring a stigma with it, or in some cases was even illegal, is now acceptable. In other words, we might say the canon, the range of acceptable sexual behavior has been massively expanded. Uh, I remember when I was growing up, I had a great aunt who was divorced, and we were never allowed to mention it at home because there was such shame attached to divorce. I remember asking my dad once, you know, what was a husband like? And dad, my dad said, all I can remember him, he said, after the Second World War, when uh, we would say sweets, he would say when candy, when candy was rationed, he said, her husband would take my candy ration. So I thought, oh yeah, he sounds like a complete swine, in other words. She was good to get rid of him. You know, what kind of a man steals a kid's candy ration after the war? Uh, but the thing was that divorce carried a huge stigma. Whereas now, it, it doesn't carry a stigma. Uh, and uh, there are many sexual behaviors that, that no longer carry a stigma. And as many conservative types and conservative Christians, we tell them that's the sexual revolution. It was a loosening and expanding of the bounds of sexual morality. Actually, it's not that. I think what the sexual revolution is, is the abolition of the notion of sexual morality in its entirety. What I mean by that, you might say, yeah, but Truman, we still have rules about sexual behavior. I'd say, yes, but those rules are not connected to the intrinsic morality of sexual acts. Those rules are con uh, connected to the issue of whether those acts take place within a context of consent. It's the consensual nature of sexual acts or the lack of consent that provides their moral content today. That's a huge shift. A hundred years ago, certain sexual acts were regarded as intrinsically immoral. If you engaged in them, then you were engaged in immorality. Now, I'm not making uh, the argument here whether that view is right or wrong. I'm simply saying the sexual revolution was in the game of getting rid of that intrinsic notion of the morality of sexual acts in its entirety. Sex becomes just another act, and it's the context in which it takes place that provides it with its morality. And I think we can see the, uh, uh, we can see the, the way this plays out uh, if you think, for example, of the concept of modesty. You know, when I first became a Christian, there were debates in the church about modesty, yeah, the, you know, in many ways, they were very sexist debates, I suppose, because they generally focused on women's clothing. I was never involved in a discussion of the modesty of men's clothing. Though my wife and I followed a man through uh, Dallas Airport the other day whose trousers or pants were sort of down at his knees. <laughs> and I, I said to Christina, I, do you think I should offer him money to buy, so he could buy some trousers of the right size, you know, and cover himself up? I, I was thinking that it was immodest. But, of course, if you make that comment today, you'll be mocked. We don't have debates about modesty anymore because modesty is an inherently ridiculous concept in modern culture. And that goes to the transformation that the sexual revolution has brought about. Uh, I've not seen, I quote this in the, in the book, but I've not seen the movie The 40-Year-Old Virgin, but I know it's a comedy. I know it's a comedy because that very concept is now presented in society as ridiculous. For somebody to reach the age of 40 and have had no sexual experience speaks of somebody who is unfulfilled. We might almost say only partly human, perhaps. Modesty. We don't now, you know, we don't now debate the limits of the concept of modesty because modesty as a concept no longer has any credibility whatsoever. I was, it sounds odd, but earlier this week I was speaking to a gathering of uh, the Latter-day Saints in Salt Lake City on this same issue. And at the conference I was invited to speak at, uh, they had some wedding dresses on display, and I didn't know they were wedding dresses, so the, the LDS man who was leading me through the, the conference center, uh, I said, oh, do these dresses have religious significance? And he said, oh, they're wedding dresses. Uh, and then he said, uh, we like our wedding dresses to be modest. And these wedding dresses all came down to the the wrists. Uh, and I thought, isn't that interesting? I've not heard anybody say that for a long time. Even in Christian circles, I haven't heard people say that for a long time. Modesty, still alive and well in Salt Lake City, one might say. And I thought, yeah, that's interesting. That's a concept that has really disappeared. So the sexual revolution, that's the third term that I think we need to be clear on 
when we come to think about the issues of identity we're going to address today. Now let's see if I can do this thing. Yes. But above all, I want to suggest that underlying the changes we're now seeing in society around us is a new notion of the self or a notion of the self that has emerged over the last 300 years that is captured by the term expressive individualism. Remember that term. It's very important. It's very important for a number of reasons, not least of which is the fact that there's a sense, and I'm not going to talk about this much today, but you, if you wish, you may ask me about it during the Q&A. There's a sense in which we're all expressive individualists. There's a great temptation in conservative circles to stand in judgment over people in the LGBTQ plus movement. But what I'm going to suggest today is they are one symptom of an unfortunate phenomenon to which we all belong. And that should immediately change our attitude, that the way we often approach such issues can resemble the Pharisee in the temple with the publican. I thank you, Lord, that I'm not like other men, like this LGBTQ plus person over here. Uh, and of course, the Pharisee is not highly approved of in that parable. I think if we start to think of all of ourselves as expressive individuals, it cuts the capacity for unfortunate self-righteousness when we deal with these things. But what is expressive individualism? This is the definition given by the great uh, sociologist slash philosopher uh, Robert Bella, who I think you coined the term in his great book in the 1990s, Habits of the Heart, where he was examining the normative type of self that was emerging in American society. And he said this, Expressive individualism holds that each person has a unique core of feeling and intuition that should unfold or be expressed if individuality is to be realized. Let's read that again. Expressive individualism holds that each person has a unique core of feeling and intuition that should unfold or be expressed if individuality is to be realized. Now, when I started this talk, I started by saying I want to offer a definition of the self. That is the normative definition of the self with which most of us in the West now operate. It is the modern self. The big question is, where does it come from and how did we get here? What that definition says, of course, is that the person you really are is the person you feel you are inside that you are ultimately constituted by your feelings and that the way you live your life is driven ultimately by the satisfaction or the expression of those feelings. The example I use in the book in order to sort of make it clear what I'm saying here is, is the contrast between myself and my grandfather. Uh, my grandfather was a uh, sheet metal worker in Birmingham in the United Kingdom in England. You may have noticed my accent uh, betrays the fact I'm not from Camden, New Jersey, uh, though I did live near Camden for many years. Uh, my grandfather was a sheet metal worker in Birmingham, the Detroit, the industrial heartland, the heart of the automobile industry in England uh, from uh, the 20s through to the 60s when he retired. Uh, he spent, you know, he left school at 14 and he spent 50 plus years working in a factory, doing work that I would regard as, uh, as, as, as drudge work, I suppose. But if I said to my grandfather, you know, Grandad, did you, did you get satisfaction from your work? I think his answer, well, I think first of all, he would not quite have understood the question because the very question itself would have been somewhat irrelevant to him. But if I'd explained it and said, so, so Grandad, did you find your work worthwhile? I think he'd have said, yeah, because I put in a, a, an honest day's work and I got paid most of the time. My granddad was a trade unionist, uh, uh, and at points uh, he went out on strike. But he would have said, yeah, I, I, I put in a, a hard day's work and I got a fair day's pay for it. And that allowed me to put food on the table, pay the mortgage on my house, although actually granddad never had a mortgage. He was a poor man, but he told me he'd never been in debt a day in his life. Can you imagine that? Poor man who was never in debt a day in his life. He said, allowed me to put food on the table and shoes on my children's feet. 
The answer, in other words, my grandfather would give, my job gave me satisfaction because it enabled me to fulfill my obligations to others. That was the key thing for him. Ask me the same question, and I'm going to say, yeah, I get, I, I get job satisfaction. I love teaching kids. I love uh, being in class and discussing great ideas with kids. I, I love that moment when some kid who's been struggling to grasp an idea, you know, the light bulb, I see the light bulb goes on in their mind. There I suddenly they grasp it and it makes sense. It snaps into focus. And that gives me a great buzz when that happens. Notice my answer. My answer is all about my feelings. My answer is all about my psychology. My job gives me satisfaction because it meets my psychological needs, we might say. I'm an expressive individualist. That's part of the culture in which uh, I live and move and have my being. The sea change between my grandfather and myself is culturally very, very significant. And I think absolutely germane to the kind of issues we now face in broader Western society. So the question becomes then, how do we get here? Selves don't emerge overnight. Selves, the, the, the normative notion of the human self, emerges, changes over a long period of time. Well, in order to understand that, first uh, we need to grab a hold of another concept with the slightly awkward name of the social imaginary. Now, the social imaginary, it's really odd that uh, Charles Taylor, the philosopher who uses this term, uses the term imaginary as a noun. To me, imaginary has always been an adjective, but he actually uses it as a noun. Well, okay, we'll, we'll humor him on that front. We'll stick with the, uh, the language. But here's the definition that he gives of the social imaginary. It's in his uh, great work, A Secular Age. I want to speak, he says, of social imaginary here rather than social theory because there are important differences between the two. There are, in fact, several differences. You get the impression that you could do with a good editor. The book's about 800 pages long. It could be 500 pages long and just if good, if not better, if they cut out extraneous sentences, you know, like he just repeated himself. I speak of imaginary, one, because I'm talking about the way ordinary people imagine their social surroundings. And this is often not expressed in theoretical terms. It is carried in images, stories, legends, etc. But it is also the case that, two, theory is often the possession of a small minority Whereas what is interesting in the social imaginary is that it is shared by large groups of people, if not the whole society. Which leads to a third difference. Three, the social imaginary is that common understanding which makes possible common practices and a widely shared sense or legitimacy. It's the first two points I want to deal with just now. We'll sort of touch on the third point a bit later. What Taylor is saying there is the way that most of us live and think is not particularly self-conscious. I could take uh, an example and say, when I leave this lecture theater, I'm going to leave through the door at the back. I think the last time I read a science book, I was 15. I have no idea. I mean, I have a broad, you know, rough idea of, of atoms, etc., etc. But I have no theoretical idea. I can't give you a theoretical account of why I can leave through the door, and if I try to leave through the wall, I'm going to hurt myself. I can't give you a theoretical account of that. I'm not going to reflect at the end of this lecture, okay, I need to leave this room. Let me go and let me, let me think about atomic structures over there. Oh yeah, that's the point I need to go through. I'm going to intuitively walk through the door. It's an intuition I have. I don't reflect on first principles. And of course, that actually, that's an example of a sort of physical thing. But an awful lot of the way we think about the world is intuitive. I leave today and I see an old lady being beaten up over the other side of the road. I'm either going to run and help her or I'm going to dial and call the police for help. I'm not going to Google, you know, what do you do when old ladies are being beaten up? Is it a good thing or a bad thing? I intuitively know, I intuitively respond to that situation. Think about the trans issue. You could attend a Judith Butler seminar on gender theory or queer theory and be deeply schooled in European continental philosophy that underlines, that underlies the, the distinction that is now routinely made between biological sex and gender. 
there is a whole theoretical framework to justify that distinction. But your neighbor, who now calls Bruce Jenner Caitlyn Jenner, is unlikely to have attended those seminars. To them, it's just an intuitive thing. The question is, why is it intuitive? Well, I think Taylor here, he says, you know, a lot of this stuff is carried in stories, things like that. Uh, media presentations. Our intuitions are not typically shaped by reading heavy tomes on particular subjects. Our intuitions are shaped by the world we inhabit imaginatively on a day-to-day -day basis. So one of the things that lies behind the transformation of the modern self, this rise of expressive individualism, is this is something we intuit now. It's not that we've read theoretical books on it. It's the view of the self that is projected to us from every billboard, every commercial, every movie, every TV show, every newspaper, every neighbor. It's the air we breathe. It's the air we breathe that has made us the kind of people we are. It's intuitive. It's intuitive. And that's why I love Taylor for addressing this stuff and why I use Taylor in the work I do on this in that I think that what Taylor does that so many people miss is this. Taylor realizes we're not dealing with arguments here. You can provide arguments for stuff as I did at that Bible college when the student was pressing me on gay marriage. But the lack of communication that day was based on the fact that that student had not actually been convinced of their position by an argument. It just seemed intuitively right to them. And they might well push back on me and say, well, you're offering me arguments, but all you're doing really is trying to find arguments to justify your intuitions because the world you inhabit intuitively thinks in a certain way. So the social imaginary, I want you to hold that in mind and realize the, the issues we face today. You know, it's not a question of getting the, the right Supreme Court judgment. There is no silver bullet argument out there that, hey, if we get hold of that and use that, all of the dominoes will fall. It's a much broader phenomenon in which we're all implicated. So that's the sort of the point that I want to make this morning. How do we imagine ourselves today? Well, think of that statement. I'm a woman trapped in a man's body. My granddad died nearly 30 years ago now. Again, uh, my granddad, I love my granddad, and he's sort of the, un, uh, the, 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 the absent presence in an awful lot of my lectures because he's a great guy to sort of use as a contrast to myself. Uh, and he usually comes out ahead, by the way. I, I, my granddad was a much greater man than I will ever be. But if I would say to my granddad, you know, hey, granddad, uh, I met this person who thinks they're a man trapped in a woman's body or a woman trapped in a man's body, my granddad would probably have burst out laughing or would have expressed great confusion at that because it's not the way he imagined that the imaginative framework for that sentence to make sense didn't exist for him. You can think about it. Um, if you were to go to a doctor say, a hundred years ago, and say to the doctor, uh, I'm a woman trapped in a man's body. The doctor would have said, that's a problem. Uh, the problem is with your mind, and therefore we need to treat your mind, and bring it into line with your body. If you go to a doctor today, the doctor may well be compelled by force of law to say, well, that's a problem. It's a problem with your body. We need to bring it in line with your mind. Now, setting aside any questions on who's right and who's wrong, Think about the shift that's taken place culturally between those two moments and what underlies that shift. And I would say one of the things that underlies that shift is the body has lost authority as feelings have gained authority. So one of the intuitive shifts in our culture has been the body becomes less authoritative and feelings become more authoritative. We might say expressive individualism accelerates, has been accelerating over the last hundred years, where feelings are gaining more authority. And our intuition is that feelings have more authority. Think about uh, the statements, I am gay, 
I am lesbian. And so that we, you know, so as not to be prejudiced, I'm straight. Those are strange statements historically. Because what they do is they make sex an identity. Sexual desire becomes an identity. Whether it's gay, lesbian, or straight sexual desire, I suggest that it's weird or historically odd that such desire is now foundational to identity. I did uh, classics in my undergrad, and one of the books we had to read doing classics undergrad in the 1980s was uh, Sir Kenneth Dover's great book, Greek Homosexuality, which was his study of the role of homosexuality in Greek culture and politics. Uh, and those of you who know anything about ancient Greece will know that homosexuality was rife in ancient Greece and was morally totally acceptable. Uh, but there was a difference between then and now. And the difference is this. In ancient Greece, nobody identified as gay. Homosexuality, you might say, was something you did. It wasn't something you are. Today, think about it. The fact that we can use those terms, and I could say, you know, well, I'm straight. But I would say, I've actually come to realize that using that sort of terminology is not helpful, period. Because what that's essentially doing is saying, I am my sexual desires. And I actually think that's a rather reductive view of who people are, period, regardless of those sexual desires. We've got a world where sex has become an identity, not an activity. How do we get here? We're going to talk about that a little bit later. Identity is rooted in desire. And for these things, for these two things to have become, for these to make sense, not just to the students of Judith Butler, but to the ordinary person one might stop in the street, Two things, two things have to take place, occur within that social imaginary. One, feelings and desires have to become more important than bodies. And secondly, and I, and I don't have time to talk about this today, but I do make a distinction between the LG, the G, and the, B, the LGBQ and the T. I think the T is a little different in that acronym. But second, at least for the L, the G, the B, and the Q, sexual desire must become decisive for identity, and that must be the intuition we have. 400 years ago, if uh, your child had come to you and said, I've never slept with anybody, but I'm gay, that would have sounded ridiculous. Today, of course, you can have the desire and not have the sexual experience, and the statement makes sense, precisely because desires have come to shape how we intuit identity. So how do we get here? Number of ways. There is an inward turn. You know, over the next few slides, we're going to, have to finish in five minutes and continue after the break, but we have to cover an awful lot of history rather superficially. But there is an inward turn in Western society that really starts to gain pace at the Reformation. Think about most of you here, probably Protestants. We believe in justification by faith. That means that our identity is grounded in our personal individual belief in a deep and profound way. We might say our inner psychology starts to become a real driving force at the Reformation. And by the way, when I, you know, when I say expressive individualism, I'm not saying it's all bad, by the way. I'm just saying it's a thing. It manifests itself in different ways. I actually think it's a good thing. Justification by faith is a good thing. It's a good thing. But it does bring about this inward turn. And the inward turn really starts to accelerate with this man, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who is, I think, um, the more influential of the two famous Genevans. John Calvin, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Rousseau, 18th century French philosopher, whose philosophy had a profound impact on politics. It uh, paved the way for the French Revolution. Uh, had a profound impact on educational philosophy, child-centered learning, sort of tracks back to Rousseau. Rousseau was the man who, who articulates in a rather pungent form that it's society that screws you up. Rousseau is the man who says, you know, it really, if only we could have been left alone, we would be naturally good and empathetic. It's because we find ourselves in social situations where we become envious, jealous, competitive. 
where we become ambitious, where we have to start playing the parts that other people want us to play in order to get on. It's really in that kind of context uh, that we get corrupted. I don't think Rousseau ever uses the term, but the idea of what's called the noble savage is used to summarize his thinking. That if human beings could be unencumbered by society, we would be intuitively, instinctively good. Our emotions would make us naturally empathetic towards others. So Rousseau is the man who really says, you know, it's society that corrupts you. Think about that. Go to 2015, Diane Sawyer's uh, interview with uh, Bruce, now Caitlyn Jenner. You can find it online. There's a transcript online. It's very interesting to read that uh, interview because it's very Rousseau-esque in many ways. Jenner uses the language of, all my life I've lived a lie. All my life I've had to play this part that society expected from me. And now finally I'm able to be truly myself. That's kind of Rousseau language. That's Rousseau's philosophy. Jenner would say, it was society that forced me to be something other than that which I really am. And now finally, I'm able to break with that and be the real me. And if Rousseau had read that, he would say, you know, I, I, Rousseau would certainly have said, I don't understand transgenderism. But I understand what Jenner's saying at this point. That the real Jenner was the Jenner inside before society forced that person into its preordained mold. So Rousseau is a key figure in this. And then next, just before we, we take our first break, the Romantics. <clears throat> romantics provide some of my favorite artwork in all history, whether it's poetry, painting, or music. I think the Romantics are, are the tops. Uh, if you listen to Romantic music, uh, what does it do? It pulls on the heartstrings. It doesn't have the, the structure and the order of a Bach. Bach is wonderful to listen to precisely because of that balance and order. Do you even get in Mozart? But then when you move into Beethoven, particularly the later Beethoven and the, and the string quartets, the late string quartets, I know nothing about music, but I can tell something's changing here. The form is starting to break down. And the feelings are starting to flow through. And then when you move into Liszt, or somebody like Wagner, uh, and the music is a direct strike at the heart. It's not the brain. Bach sort of appeals to the brain. I've got mathematician friends. They love Bach because to them it's, it's mathematics musically expressed. To me, no time for mathematics. It's Liszt. It's Chopin because that's the heart. It's the emotions that flow through. The Romantic movement is the movement that really builds on Rousseau in many ways and places feelings and the expression of feelings at the heart of the artistic project. And in some ways, the culture we live in now is a sort of uh, very degraded Romantic culture because what we live with today in terms of art is this let it all hang out kind of philosophy. It's crude, it's not sophisticated, it's awful, to be honest, but it's very much in line with that striking at the emotions and the passions. And when you have artwork like that, it makes you start to think about yourself in a certain way. The real me is my emotions. The real me is not the me that, that learns to conform. The real me is the me that expresses itself. Okay, that's our first lecture. We will break there. We will come back and, uh, uh, well, I guess we get instructions on the break. Steve will come and give you instructions on what we're going to do in the break. Well, that's a lot, but it's also starting to connect some dots, I trust, in your minds and raising some questions. Just a couple of reminders before our break. As those questions are being generated, especially here early on, 
There's a question form at the back of your, the last page of your program, and there's two wicker baskets at the sound booth bar there. So if you'd write a question down, we'll sort through those and try to address those. Our very last session uh, later this afternoon will be a Q&A with Dr. Truman, and we'll try to get to as many of those as we can. So as you have questions, write them down, put them in the basket there. Also, we have refreshments and snacks and drinks are in the fellowship hall. You just have to navigate the fire zone a little bit outside, and they're down in the back building. Um, and there's plenty of refreshments there, getting snacks and water. We also, if you've already seen, have plenty of books out here on the book tables behind you. I want to just note a couple. Of course, we have Dr. Truman's book. We also have uh, this, When Harry Became Sally by Ryan T. Anderson. Uh, Dr. Anderson is the president of the Ethics and Public Policy Center, of which just this week Dr. Truman was named a fellow. And he helpfully walks through the difference between what is presented about transgenderism in the media and the reality behind it, both scientifically and personally. It's a very, very helpful book. It was so good, Amazon banned it. So uh, that should be enough to have a copy by there. Also, um, Rod Dreher has written Live Not By Lies, which is a helpful look at the, what he calls the soft totalitarianism and the rise in the West. And he especially does a lot of interviews and discussions with those who live behind the Iron Curtain, drawing parallels and giving also a positive way forward for Christians and how they're to live in our new society, Live Not By Lies. Also, if you want a sort of shorter version of many of the themes and things that Dr. Truman talks about. He wrote the foreword also to this book by Melvin Tinker, That Hideous Strength. And he's writing from more of a, a UK perspective in Britain, but he really helpfully and in a succinct way walks through some of the themes of uh, critical theory, cultural Marxism, and some of the changes also that we see that Dr. Truman is bringing out. Melvin Tinker, That Hideous Strength. And then finally, I would just plug, and especially if you're a parent or someone who cares about young people, Michael Kruger's Surviving Religion 101. I would say if you have a high school student, this book needs to be in their hands, and especially if they're preparing for college. He wrote this as letters to his daughter on her way to college and about how she would navigate the brave new world of today's college campuses as a Christian. It's a very, very helpful book that covers a wide variety of topics in a very succinct way. It'd be great for even small group studies and readings as well. So there's many others out there. I encourage you to take a look at those, and we'll be back at 1030 for session two.